Dr. Ivan Aransky. It's a pleasure to have you today on Research and Beyond, a podcast dedicated to making researcher journey easier. Thank you so much for accepting my invite and being a part of the podcast today. My pleasure. Good to be here. And today, as we speak of science and research, uh, we can't just take everything at face value, as everyone would, may, uh, would agree here. Uh, there needs to be a system of checks and balances, someone keeping an eye on things and making sure everything is above board. That's where science journalism comes in. And when I think of them, one name that pops in my mind without a second door is of you, Dr. Aransky. While I'm particularly intrigued in your current role as the editor-in-chief of The Transmitter and the distinguished journalist in residence at New York University's Carter Journalism Institute, I strongly believe that your efforts in teaching the next generation of medical journalists must be immensely rewarding. Oh, it's very rewarding to teach students, um, mostly because I uh, learn probably more from them than uh, I, I teach them. Uh, it's, um, it's a great privilege to be able to do that. And I've been doing that for almost half my life for, for actually, you know, for more than two decades. And um, I just, it, every year I learn something new. So it's really terrific. That's commendable. And um, also your journey from, you know, earning a medical degree at NYU to becoming a globally recognized voice in science communication is remarkable, in my opinion, for someone who has been in the industry for only five years now. Um, that's me. So it's uh, really uh, inspiring to look at your journey in that area. And of course, we can't uh, discuss your accomplishments without mentioning Retraction Watch who I have been following uh, day and night. Uh, the groundbreaking initiative, as I may call it so, that you co-founded to promote accountability and integrity in scientific research. It has undoubtedly transformed the landscape of scholarly publishing in ways more than one, I would like to believe. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I, I'm very kind to say that. I generally leave it to other people to say whether or not we've had an impact. Um, I hope we have, but uh, really, I, I we're just trying to um, tell stories and uh, document what's going on. And if that's helpful, um, that's terrific. Absolutely. So today, as we speak and unravel some intricacies and unknown facts of investigative journalism, I'm eager to dive into your perspectives on the evolving role of journalism in safeguarding scientific rigor, exposing misconduct, and fostering public trust in research, especially in this AI advent times. So thank you again for being here, Dr. Aransky. Oh, good to be here. To begin with, I would like to ask you and take people back to where you started from. So from having to attend Harvard to becoming one of the most influential science journalists. Could you please take us through your journey in short and what influenced your interest in this area? Uh, sure, and again, I, I, don't, um, I don't know that I'm one of the most influential science journalists. I can think of a lot of people who've done a lot of important work uh, who are certainly better known, um, but I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I, I was a interested in journalism ever since I was a, uh, really a, a, an early adolescent, um, probably around 10 or 11 years old. I, I was reading uh, the New York Times, and there was a reporter then. He was there for 40 years uh, named Lawrence Altman, Lawrence Altman, and uh, he was able to use his medical degree to do amazing uh, reporting, and really insightful reporting. And, uh, you know, so I got interested in journalism then, uh, particularly medical, you know, science and medical journalism, and uh, was very involved in my, my high school newspaper, my college newspaper. Uh, in medical school, I was the editor, co-editor-in-chief of the medical student section of JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. So uh, I've sort of always done this, um, and, uh, you know, at some point I decided to do it full-time. That was about 25 years ago, and um, so I don't practice medicine. Uh, never have. I, I finished medical school, but 
um, decided to, you know, after my internship, that first year of, of training, I've uh, been in journalism full time ever since. Then. Yes, that's absolutely um, inspiring also because a lot of people taking academic studies and getting into a profession, deciding that that will be their vocation later on, uh, but eventually end up into doing something else that interests them the most. So when you took up journalism as your profession or something that interested you, uh, you may have come across a lot of instances where there may have been certain high profile cases or, you know, certain um, situations where you may have to protect the whistleblowers. So how do you manage doing that while you're reporting misconduct? Well, I think, I mean, it is very important to protect whistleblowers, but uh, not all whistleblowers need protection. Sometimes they're actually powerful people who are calling it, you know, calling attention to problems in literature. Um, there are ways to keep people anonymous. Uh, I think that uh, journalists, and I, I trained as one. I really trained as one of my college newspaper. Um, we learn how to do those things. There's never a hundred percent security uh, in anything, but. Uh, there are ways to, um, again, protect sources. But I think the most important thing is to be honest with them and to give them a sort of informed consent about what might happen. Um, despite whatever efforts I may make, and, and we make considerable efforts to protect anonymous sources, that doesn't necessarily protect people. Uh, sometimes people make what they don't realize are mistakes uh, in terms of their social media profiles or other profiles. So uh, I, I would say there's, there are a lot of times where we actually end up not pursuing stories because when we talk to people who bring us stories who are often very frustrated with the way the system works um, because most people don't like to admit mistakes and a lot of people threaten lawsuits and what have you and, and other kinds of retaliation. Um, and, you know, often people will say, you know, I, I didn't really appreciate all of those potential risks. So... Um, thank you. Uh, I'm not, I don't think I want to move forward. And we respect that. We, um, if there's publicly available information that we can uh, obtain without uh, putting anyone at risk, we of course do that. But, you know, often the kinds of information that we need to pursue a story really could only, um, only be obtained through certain means that basically would out the, uh, the whistleblower, the, the person who knows that. And so, you know, we, we do what we can. Yes, absolutely. I completely agree with what you said. And it's not always that sometimes the misconduct could be uh, pretty unintentional as well. And in that cases, when the whistleblowers are something that they would not, uh, as you mentioned, they would want to be anonymous in certain cases. And if the information is publicly available, be it so. Uh, but in this due process, uh, how much of an impact uh, has science journalism had in improving accountability and self-correction in science? Are people now afraid of the repercussions uh, that they may have to face at whatever stage of career that they are at? Well, I think that there is more acceptance and uh, certainly visibility of uh, platforms like pubgear.com, which you know, I'm on the board of directors of, of that organization, where people can leave comments, often anonymously and often critically, um, and news outlets around the world are have been now writing about these cases. We, when we first started, co-founded when Adam and I co-founded Retraction Watch in 2010, there were not a lot of people interested in this ma subject matter. I mean, there were some great there was some great reporting going on. There were even books about these subjects, but nothing all that consistent. People would episodically report on it. Uh, now we have we see lots of reporters who, um, you know, either see what we were doing or got you know some other inspiration, and so it's more accepted. Uh, you know, there has there continues to be pushback. Uh, people um, find reasons to, um, you know, object to an anonymity. For example, they find reasons to uh, circle the wagons, as we say here in the states, around people accused of misconduct. And certainly there are some false allegations or allegations that were made, even made in good faith and don't hold up. Um, but the bigger problem is that uh, too many journals and scientists and institutions uh, and even governments uh, continue to act as if none of the allegations were true. And that's really problematic. So, uh, and, and again, whistleblowers and 
sluits, which we call them. They're not they're not all technically whistleblowers, but as whistleblowers, you have to be within an organization that uh, is affected. Yes. Well, you know, it's happening. Um, some of, you know, the sleuths face, uh, most of them are not paid, uh, and they face, um, I mean, I'm not paid for attraction watch either, that's a volunteer activity, but they face, uh, you know, threats of lawsuits. Um, very rare that people actually file lawsuits, but uh, when they do, that can be quite crippling financially. So um, I think people are aware of that, but many of them persevere because they are seeing how important it is to uh, correct the record and to hopefully, therefore, you know, bring back trust in science, which has taken some hits in the last several years. Yes, yes, I absolutely agree. And adding to your point, especially when it comes to, uh, let's say, investigative journalism in medical and healthcare, um, journalists face a lot of numerous uh, obstacles in their pursuit of healthcare stories, maybe legal hurdles, as you mentioned, lawsuits. Uh, defamation laws is one of the reasons that probably schools are not really wanting to bring it up, uh, which can also impede access to information and sources, uh, if I'm right? Well, if someone, you know, responses to defamation lawsuits depend on the jurisdiction. Um, here in the States, uh, truth is a defense for libel. Correct. So, um, the the uh, it it really behooves people who are going to get involved in this kind of work to understand what the libel laws are in their particular jurisdiction uh, and what protects them and in fact maybe even to obtain uh, defamation insurance which we have at attraction law um, very well meaning and incredibly brave sleuths uh, often I think. Um, don't have that kind of training, don't have that kind of background. And so, it, you know, that can land them into trouble, not because they've actually done anything wrong, but because a lawsuit can be, as, as I mentioned, financially crippling. So I, I think that it makes sense to consult with someone about what you're doing when you're posting uh, a blog or something like that. Uh, not everyone will agree with me on that, and I respect that. Um, we in 14 years at Attraction Watch have never been sued, and we have, on average, we've put up more than I, I think it's something close to 7,000 posts now. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, most of which are about bad behavior or allegations of bad behavior, and we've never been sued. And so, you can interpret that a few different ways. Uh, you could interpret it as we aren't really telling you know, the whole story that we could. And I, I suppose there's some element of that uh, because we only publish what we can verify. Uh, or you could say that we actually, Adam and I, because even going into this project had well over a decade of experience each. And now we have well over two decades of experience each doing this kind of work and being journalists that we understand what libel is. Um, so I think it's really important um, to not, only think about how to support your claims about a particular case after you're sued. Uh, you should actually be prepared and, you know, almost act as if you're, you could be sued at any time, which, which is true. Absolutely. And it's remarkable to know that, you know, in the journey of Retraction Watch so far, uh, the Retraction Watch has never had to face any of these instances. And that's amazing. Uh, that just guarantees the kind of investigation that goes into reporting something. It's not uh, just off the bat, uh, kind of an information or, you know, releasing a, a press release, for example, out of an institution or whatever. I believe there goes an intricate level of investigation that goes into um, it and reporting uh, these instances. Uh, I recently came across uh, this news on retraction, about Retraction Watch that the database has recorded over, I think, 47,000 uh, retractions uh, recently. And um, now today, when you rec record and report 40, over 40,000 uh, plus retractions, what was, when you go back and think about the inspiration behind find, founding Retraction Watch in 2010, what was that like? What instigated you to, oh, I need to find find this uh, out? Well, Adam Marcus, again, my co-founder, he had 
broken a really big story about scientific misconduct, about clinical trial misconduct. Uh, someone like Scott Rubin, who had faked all of the data in his clinical trial. And when I read his stories about this in 2008, 2009, uh, I was at Scientific American at the time. We actually uh, picked up one of those stories and, and did our own story. And of course, with credit to Adam's amazing work. And it made me think that there were lots of good stories hiding in plain sight, that people were not um, writing about these because I hadn't than hearing about them. I, I knew what retractions were. I had re reported about a few of them here and there, uh, but I hadn't really done a careful study. I hadn't really um, you know, pushed on this. And so I, Adam and I would talk about this case and about other cases we'd see. And you know, eventually in 2010, I went to him and said, you know, what if we wrote a blog about it? Uh, and so you know, the inspiration really was Adam's work and the, uh, the sort of what made us think that there was something that we would occasionally write about was the, there were retractions all the time. We also noticed that the retraction notices were often um, either unhelpful or misleading, and we thought that was a bad thing for science. And so um, we didn't actually think about the database for some years. So probably about within a year or so, maybe a year or two, Adam and I realized that we couldn't keep up with you know all the retractions anymore. We, we there were far more of them than we thought. Uh, and they also weren't being recorded in all the databases that they should have been. And so, you know, in 2014, uh, foundations began calling us um, and saying, you know, you're doing interesting work that we think deserves some support. What would you what, what would you like to do? Um, it's a wonderful kind of call to get. And we um, we said, well, what the world really needs is a, a, a complete, comprehensive um, and fact-checked and verified database of retraction. So we embarked on that with some very generous funding from a few foundations and launched it in 2018. And then last year, uh, five years after we launched the, the database, and, and at the time that we, last year when this happened, there were about 43, 44,000 retractions in it. Now there are about 48,000. Um, it was acquired by Crossref, which is another nonprofit. We're a nonprofit as well. Um, and now it's freely available and we have sustainability for that part of what we do. We're continuing to maintain it. Everything stays the same except that it belongs to Crossref and it's part of their data now. Um, and I think that's a recognition that this was something the world needed, um, that publishers weren't really doing uh, the way they were supposed to, and that you know the databases that should have had the, those data, those metadata, uh, didn't have access to them because the publishers weren't doing what they were supposed to. Yes, and uh, definitely, like when you said that, what inspired you into when Adam Marcus also started, you know, no, uh, kind of reporting these instances, and then you all came up with the whole blog idea. Uh, post that, like now over a decade later, after co-founding it together, um, and then receiving the kind of funds that you received, the recent, you know, uh, Crossref acquiring Retraction uh, Watches database. Um, can we say mission accomplished with what intent that Retraction Watch was um, founded initially? I think there have been some important strides. I think there's been progress, but yes. uh, mission accomplished is, is way far off. Uh, and I don't know if we'll ever get there. I think we, the, the mission is to, the real mission is to, um, you know, cut down on waste and, uh, you know, bad behavior if possible in science. Um, that's a much bit larger mission than simply, you know, research integrity, improving research integrity. That's a much larger mission than creating a database as much work as that was. So, no, I don't believe we've, uh, we're anywhere near mission accomplished. I think there, there, there have been some important, there's been some important progress. And, and I think we should all be, uh, take stock of that. And otherwise it becomes, you know, like Hercules. Uh, but um, I think, you know, I, I, I don't think we should say mission accomplished. That's uh, that's really humble of you, but also agreed that, you know, even after exposing several um, cases of research misconduct so far, there still are certain ethical violations happening in scientific literature that we are not completely uh, gotten rid of. Uh, in that area, what are some of the biggest ethical lapses or forms of misconduct you see occurring in research? 
and what are the current challenges in mitigating them at the moment so that like while we are trying to reach at the mission we're somewhere there we're leading a progressive life uh, but how can we with the current challenges how can we mitigate those well i think i mean there are lots of different kinds of misconduct happening i mean the one that's in the news a lot lately is paper mills uh and uh people who are you know acting unethically or even illegally by making use of paper mills or buying authorship um but that's you know that i think we can that can obscure the interest in that can obscure what's been going on for years in terms of manipulating images in terms of uh plagiarism in terms of um sort of p hacking and other sorts of uh you know um problems in the literature and analytical problems, uh, QR and other QRPs, you know, uh, sort of um, research practices that are not, you know, cute, they're not quality. Um, so I think that we have to look the way upstream because what's driving this behavior is the incentive structure. Uh, it's publish or perish. It's the overarching need to publish and therefore be cited because universities want to increase their their rankings, right? They want to improve their rankings. And um, that has, I think, led to, if not all, then the vast majority of bad behavior in science. Um, it's hard to see how it wouldn't. And so what we really need to be doing, in addition, right, in addition to looking for the problems and doing something about them, is to look at why they're happening to begin with. And that, that we have to go way upstream. I, I use the metaphor of uh, sewage getting into the ocean. We don't we don't want sewage getting into the ocean. We want, so we need to build sewage treatment plants at the mouths of rivers right before they get into the ocean. But we also need to go way upstream and look at why is raw sewage getting into the, and, and pollution getting into streams and rivers to begin with. Um, because if we don't do that, you can build all the pollution plants, excuse me, um, sewage so, so treatment plants you want, uh, you won't actually get to, um, you won't actually solve the problem. I absolutely agree. And uh, the way you mentioned that, you know, it's necessary for us to identify where it begins at, right? Uh, we need to go upstream rather than just treating the sewage at the mouth of the rivers, right? When they, When it's connecting to the ocean. So that's a very good metaphor, and I'm sure I'm going to use it somewhere. Um, but when we talk about these different kinds of misconducts that you mentioned, uh, be it with, in terms of having to pay for authorships or paper mills, um, and even the fear that especially young researchers have, which is in terms of publish or perish, um, are there certain disciplines that you may have come across in your experience where you tend to find higher rates of problematic behavior exposed when you investigate the process? Uh, no. And I, I think, uh, you know, I'm asked this question a lot. It's a natural question, but I, I would say that um, because we're only really investigating the process of Correct. whether it's happening or not, uh, what I tend to say is that when I see fields that don't have that many attractions, I think it's because nobody's looking at the problem. So the fields that have more attractions, it's generally because people are actually looking um and that's a good thing and we shouldn't if the all if you punish more attractions which is what a lot of people seem to want to do and sort of point to attractions as a as a somehow meaning the field has is in more shape if you do that all you'll do is you know disincentivize correcting the record you'll disincentivize attraction so i think we need to normalize attractions and Again, if you look at fields, we have a, a ranking of all the people with the most attractions in the world. Um, a lot of them, more than you would expect, are from anesthesiology. Uh, that's because anesthesiology, which had the problem that hmm. actually the story of which led to the creation of Retraction Watch, realized years ago that it had a problem, uh, maybe before any other field, or at least at the same time as a couple other fields. And so they have more attractions. We, we, should, we should actually applaud that. Yeah. So in addition to my previous question, I also wanted to understand uh, in terms of how has this scrutiny from the public or publishers and even funding agencies evolved with respect to the disclosure of retractions and instances of research misconduct? 
Um, well, again, I, I think that there is just because there's so much more uh, conversation about these issues happening, um, more people are coming forward. There's there's more opportunities for people to do that. Uh, again, there's still some backlash. There's still some uh, sort of, um, you know, attempts to say, well, it's just a few bad apples or, you know, it's not a systemic problem. Uh, but in fact, it is. And I think people need to grapple with that if we're going to improve things. Um, uh, but I do think that the, the in, increased conversation is is a good thing. And I think that, you know, look, the number of attractions has grown dramatically. We haven't talked about that here, but um, the rate of retraction went from about one in 5,000 papers 20 years ago to about one in 500 papers last year. And we think it should still be much higher, probably about one in 50 papers. Um, but that increase is absolutely due to more people having the opportunity to point out problems um, and to people actually doing something about it. Yes, um, definitely so. And, uh, you know, like earlier when you mentioned that struck my uh, attention when in 2023, when Crossref acquired Retraction Watches database that we were earlier speaking of, um, beyond having to make the Retraction database easily accessible to publishers, researchers, uh, what other goals did Retraction Watch aimed to accomplish with this acquisition taking place? Well, um, again, we, we did very much want to have uh, open open data. That's always been our goal. We just had to charge for it in order to be able to continue doing the work. Um, but it also brought sustainability for our efforts. Uh, we now have a five-year agreement. You know, it included an acquisition fee and a five-year agreement to continue operating the database um, and to improve the database. Uh, Crossref has tools and uh, resources that I don't know that we ever would have had, certainly don't have now, um, that will only improve uh, the presentation, it will only improve the data, improve the user experience and the capability. So this is a very exciting, uh, it was a very exciting announcement to be able to make. Yes, and congratulations on that as well. It's definitely helping a lot of us and especially funders and researchers overall in better understanding where to go about and how what best practices could they follow in terms of maintaining research integrity. So, um, we speak about AI's advent coming up soon and, you know, the ECRs are resorting to AI more than experienced research, I would say. But to what extent can we trust AI systems to detect misconduct and research fraud? Is there any alternative? Uh, AI is not the answer to funding research fraud and misconduct. Um, people found research fraud and misconduct for years before AI was even, you know, in, talked about in terms of research. So. Um, that's not the solution. The solution is to go way upstream again and actually look at the demand and look at why that's happening. Um, the, the, the solution is not AI. If AI can be helpful, that's great. Um, and I'm sure in some limited cases it can be. Uh, but I think that that will be a distraction from the amazing work and the critical work that people have already been doing. Uh, and we should be we should be looking at that. Yes, yes. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Ransky. Have a lovely thank day. Thank you. You too. Be well. At the end of the day, science is supposed to be this objective, trustworthy pursuit of knowledge. But without journalists holding institutions, publishers, and individual researchers accountable, the whole system could start to crumble. Science journalism is what keeps everyone on their toes and maintains public confidence in the sciences. So, yeah. While they might not be doing the experiments themselves, these journalists play just as important a role in the scientific world. They're the referees making sure everyone plays fair and the whole game stays legitimate. Thank you everyone for listening to Research and Beyond. See you again next time.